Up in the morning and out to school The teacher is teaching the golden rule American history and practical man You study him hard and hoping to pass Working your fingers right down to the bone Round and round and round you go Thirty three minutes after the hour, you're listening to Michael Patrick Shields radio stations all across the state of Michigan, presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and Blue Care Network. The Detroit Free Press has analyzed 67 pledges Governor Rick Snyder made in his first three state of the state addresses and found 34 percent completed, 42 percent underway and 24 largely incomplete or stalled. And uh, as you may know by now, the uh, this uh, Thursday is the governor's state of the state address on a re-election year. On the other end of our AT&T line, Senator John Prose, the Republican from St. Joseph. Nice to talk to you again. Oh, yeah. Senator Prose, uh, uh, how would you rate the governor's performance so far in his first three years? And uh, what are you hoping for in this new year? Well, I think the governor has done a remarkable job of taking what was really just terrible news over the better part of a decade and it has helped to put Michigan back on the right track with the help of the legislature and with kind of common sense reforms that I think have put us in a better position, a better position to move forward. Uh, and really, we're starting to see some of those benefits, of course, with the news last week that our revenues are up in the state, leaving open the opportunity to invest in areas that we know are most important to, to Michigan's growth in the future. What are we going to do with all that money? As I understand, we have something like $971 million, uh, extra. Well, that's that's what we're understanding. That's beyond the revenue expectations, of course. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. There's still work to be done. I know in my southwest Michigan district, there are families that still struggle. Uh, so it's important for us to recognize that kind of our talent pipeline is important when it comes to our educational systems. That's why I'm focusing on career and technical education, uh, looking at areas that we can invest and see some benefit. And, of course, roads is something that the governor has talked about. That's in process, according to those statistics, I think. Uh, we've we've got work to do in those areas also. We also have to make sure that we just don't spend it away, make sure that we value the taxpayers who send it to Lansing and recognize it's not our money, first and foremost, but it's the taxpayers who pay it. Tell me specifically what you're up to when it comes to career and technical education. Well, I think one of the areas that that we focus on in in this particular uh, discussion on career and technical education is the, the recognition that not all of our students are destined for four-year medical degrees or four-year colleges where they head to med school afterwards or law school or otherwise. But quite frankly, a lot of our students are talented in other areas, areas of technical skill, areas of, of, of skills that are needed in today's world, are needed in today's high-tech manufacturing world. And it's really important for us to make sure that we balance our credit requirements for high school graduation in a reasonable and logical way that keeps high relevance and high rigor while also recognizing that not all of our students are destined for four-year institutions, but instead are going to be fantastic entrepreneurs, are going to be fantastic with their hands, are going to be fantastic in agri-science, for example. As somebody once said to me, college is a very expensive place to figure out what you want to do with your life. Uh, and, Absolutely. You know, maybe that's, as you say, so as I understand it, now Senate Bill 66 would allow you to substitute like a PE class or uh, some sort of uh, class for something that you can actually actually tangibly learn to do? That, that in part is, is what we're talking about. I think, Michael Patrick, the most important thing that we're recognizing, though, is that our businesses that are looking for a talent pipeline are engaging in a better way with the help of this bill in coordinating with our school districts and our school kids to get into the classrooms and participate in those students' educational opportunities and allow a little bit of flexibility for the students themselves. You know, we have 1.5 million kids out there that deserve the very best chance to participate in where they can be of, of greatest value to the economy and to their futures. That's why we want to make sure that there's reasonable flexibility available. Delaney McKinley on the other end of our AT&T line tune with us here, the Director of Human Resource uh, Policy at the Michigan Manufacturers Association. This, I would imagine, is music to your ears? Absolutely. This is one of the most important things for Michigan's manufacturing sector. 
We think it's critical to the success of our sector, but also for the future of the state of Michigan as a whole. We need to make sure that there's a pipeline of skilled workers. But isn't it a scary thing to go into, given all the talk about how manufacturing is not coming back to Michigan and that the uh, sort of focus is shifting away from manufacturing? Actually, we're experiencing tremendous growth in Michigan's manufacturing Are we? sector. Yeah, absolutely. Since December 2009, we've created over 97,000 new jobs. We're number one in the nation. We're far outpacing any other industry in any other state. And what we're working on is to make sure that we have a sustainable pipeline of skilled workers to fulfill that demand. Well, uh, so what happens next, Senator, and do you expect bipartisan support? I do. In fact, we have all of the, the groups that you would want to have on board participating right now. In fact, there isn't anybody that has expressed opposition. There's a few that we'd like to get to full-blown support, but, but I think what's great about the work that we're doing right now is that it really is a Republican and Democrat effort together to recognize that, that our school kids are our future and that a proper and reasonable expectation of flexibility to make sure that they can reach that talent need in the manufacturing industry and other industries like agriculture is available. That's, that's what I'm most excited about is that this really is working together with our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. The Senate Majority Leader has been talking a little bit about uh, modifying term limits. Where, uh, it, do you have any appetite for opening that up this year? Well, I'll tell you, in an election year, it's always good to talk about the things that you'd like to do, and I think it sets the stage for future legislatures. What's clear is, is no matter what we do, whether Senator Richardville's perspective is the one that we, we head down that path, I think that looking at term limits as well as part-time legislature, which I put a resolution in on, I think is a reasonable thing to talk about. I think we ought to look at what is best when nearly every other state, Michael Patrick, is a part-time state in some way, shape, or form. There's really only four states in the nation that are full-time. Would the part-time status change the amount of money uh, that you and the members of the House make, too? Yeah, you bet it would. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. Uh, and I think that that's a reasonable thing to look at. You know, reforms aren't easy. There's going to be people on both sides of the equation that that like or dislike what you're talking about. But it seems to me that part-time, uh, as well as a change in term limits, would be a reasonable thing to talk about. My guess is, though, is that it, it, it probably doesn't have the legs to get through this year. It would be something we'd have to focus on in future legislatures, and it certainly couldn't apply to us. All right, sir. Will we see you uh, Thursday night at the uh, Tropo AT&T party before the State of the State speech? I'll be coming with the sheriff of St. Joseph County for a few minutes on our way over to the Capitol. All right, then we will see you there for sure. Thank you very much. It's a big week in uh, Michigan and a big week in Detroit, too, with the North American International Auto Show, and we look forward to seeing you. We'll be uh, broadcasting live from Tropo before the governor's State of the State speech on Thursday night. We'll have full coverage Thursday and Friday as uh, we get through the week. Lots going on this week, and uh, we have our foot on the gas, and thankfully the weather is better for both of those events as well. 41 minutes after the hour. The Dow, you ask, on uh, Friday lost 8 points. The Nasdaq was up 18 and the S&P up 4. We have earnings reports rolling this week. Major banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America are going to report fourth quarter figures. Investors are watching to see if stock values might be overblown. And the Labor Department said Friday the unemployment rate dipped to 6.7%. That's nationally. Of course, it's higher than that here in the state of Michigan. You're listening to Michael Patrick Shields radio stations all across the state of Michigan and much more on Governor Snyder's performance this week and what will happen to the arts at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Will they sell it off to pay off the bankruptcy? Stay tuned. Stay tuned.